So tonight I want to talk about beatification. What is that process from beatification or from, from a, a, a person passing away, being a holy man? What is the process from there unto canonization when someone is recognized as a saint in our church? And I'm going to take you through that process so we can get all of our, our definitions uh, correct and all of our uh, concepts correct and the different organizations that are involved. We can understand all of that. And then after that, I'll also share with you a video, which some of you may have seen, of the miracle that was approved um, in order for Father McGivney to be considered and then approved for beatification. Before we get into that, though, um, I want to share something. I, I, as you know, I'm a teacher. You can see my, my comic book things back there. It, it gets the kids a little excited uh, to let them know I'm not, the, I'm not, I'm not a boring teacher. Most of the time, sometimes I could be a little dry, I guess, depending on the topic, right? Christian history is a little rough sometimes. <laughs> but, um, you know, I want to start off with a concept that is foundational underneath this. And it should address this question. Why do we have such a thing in our church as beatification and canonization? Is it just to show prestige for someone? Is it just to recognize, like, this guy was great? Well, no, it's far beyond that. It's far deeper than that. You see, as Catholics, and really all Christians up until even after the Protestant Reformation, you're talking another 100 years after the Protestant Reformation, all Christians, as we should, believe in the communion of the saints. And that means that we are brothers, not just because we're all knights, because there are some non-knights on here tonight that I see. It's not just because we are knights, but it's also because of the love of God that each of us are brothers. We're not related to each other, literally. I mean, maybe some of us could find some connections. But we are brothers because of the love of God. And here's the thing, is we are brothers and we have sisters in our church that are connected to us as spiritual brothers and sisters to the love of God. And it says very clearly in Romans chapter 8 that neither death nor life separates us from the love of God. Well, what that means then is that even death does not end the relationship that you and I have as a brother in Christ. Those who have passed away are still our brothers and sisters in Christ. Does everyone follow so far? And so because of that, the church triumphant in heaven, the church militant here on earth, and the church suffering in purgatory, we are all one church that still has that communion. And I get chicken skin, I get goosebumps when I say that, because what does that mean? That means every time we go and receive Holy Communion, at least for a moment, all of those who have passed away, our loved ones, our moms and dads, our grandfathers, people who we love who have passed away, every time we approach our Lord and Savior in communion, the God before whom even the mountains tremble, and we receive him in the Eucharist, for that split second, we get to be in communion, and we get to be with all of our loved ones who have passed away. We get to be in communion with them in a real sense, in a real way. And what a beautiful thing for us to be able to experience every single time that we go to the Holy Mass. One of the objections that are often uh, mentioned when it comes to the communion of the saints, which makes sense, right? We're all part of the God. It says in the Bible that death does not separate us from the love of God. Therefore, it makes sense that we're all brothers and sisters. And because the saints are outside of what we understand this time, of course they can hear us. Of course they can hear millions of prayers because they are in the presence of God. They're in the beatific vision. And just as I would ask Brother Chuck to, pay, uh, to, to uh, pray for me, because I think Chuck's a really great Catholic, and I think that he actually will pray for me if I ask him to, even though, Chuck, I think you're great, I, right above you, I'm going to ask the Blessed Mother to pray for me. And I'm going to ask those who are already at the throne of God to pray for me. Because it says in James chapter 5, verse 16, that the prayer of a righteous person avails much. And even though Chuck is pretty cool, I think Father McGive me might be just a little bit above at the throne of God in the power of his intercession, right? And so that's why we have this communion of the saints. One of the objections that come up, though, is this objection that, oh, see, Catholics, you, you, you folks are crazy because you worship Mary. You worship the saints. I hear that quite frequently. And, uh, you know, I, 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 depending on how mean they are about it, I just kind of let it slide. It's, it's obviously out of ignorance. They're, 
misunderstanding or lack of understanding what we believe. It was uh, Archbishop Fulton Sheen. Let's pray for his canonization as well. But our Archbishop Fulton Sheen, he said that there are not a handful or even a hundred people on the planet that hate the Catholic Church, but there are millions that hate what they think the Catholic Church teaches, right? And so they misunderstand what the Catholic Church teaches, and they try to put it on as that's what the Church teaches. Far from it. We, of course, do not worship the saints. We do not worship Mary. We worship God and God alone. Now, I am in some sense, some sense here literally preaching to the choir, but I think that I will uh, take it one step up and show you a piece of apologetic. I wasn't planning on this, but we might as well before I get into my, um, my PowerPoint tonight. And you should be able to see a whiteboard right now. And I want to show you something, okay? There are, in Greek, there is a word. And the word in Greek that we're going to start off with is latria, all right? The word latria means adoration. It means worship, all right? I'll make this one in blue. Adoration or worship, that word latria, very, very important word. And this word means worship, and this belongs to God and God alone, all right? That belongs to God and God alone. We only provide, we only give our adoration to God. That's why we never say we're going to um, have adoration of the Blessed Mother. We never say that. We, uh, because we don't adore and worship Mary. We venerate and respect and pray uh, for her intercession, but we only give adoration to Jesus. So latria is the Latin word. It's kind of a, a, a Latin word that has Greek influence in it. Latria means adoration. The other important word here is dulia, all right? Dulia is a veneration, praise, all right? And this is more, we'll make this in a different color, maybe green. No, I like red better. So uh, dulia is veneration and praise. This is what we give the saints. Latria is what we give God and God alone. Dulia is what we give the saints. We give them veneration and praise. And I wanted to start off with that primarily for this reason. I don't think this is a new concept to you. You all know that you do not worship Mary, right? You all know that you do not worship the saints. Um, so in that sense, it's preaching to the choir. But if I take it a step further and show you where we, in our realm of prayer, we have these two different ideas, it helps us make more sense of it. Because dulia, which is veneration and praise, we give that to one another all the time. At the end of the year, when there are awards given out to consuls, right? Or let's just take something even more grand. When we have um, the Olympics and someone wins the gold medal and they stand on a podium and they sing their national anthem and everyone's clapping for them, folks, that is dulia, right? And if giving them dulia, respect and honor and, and praise for what they have accomplished, if we do that for them, how much more should we be doing that for those who died in the love of God and who were examples of faith to all of us who remain here in the church militant? Amen? And so that's why we have that difference. And that's the difference that we have the community of the saints necessitates that we understand that difference between latria and dulia, that difference between worship and praise and respect. But that's why we have saints. It's not just for, you know, a, uh, a, uh, special, a special needs program that needs someone to be their leader. It's not that. It's not just, you know, a political thing. It truly is so that we can uh, in, uh, enrich in or, you know, uh, uh, rich in our lives. Um, with following those who have gone before us in the example of faith and to also expand the list of those who we have a certainty are in the uh, blessedness of heaven, in the beatific vision, at the throne of God, who even more than the brother knights that we have, whose prayers are important too, but even more than that, we have the angelic hierarchy and uh, the saints in heaven who are before the throne of God praying for us. And that's where the importance of canonization comes in. So let's get into it, because I know that we know that uh, Father McGivney will be canonized soon or beatified soon on his way to canonization.
but it isn't just a thing that is based on, you know, uh, the church kind of on a whim deciding, yeah, I think this guy would be good. There's actually quite a big process um, behind it. And it takes many, many, many years. Some of you would remember the, the, the long path that we had on the path to having not only uh, St. Damien, but then later uh, also uh, Sister Marianne Cope be canonized as a saint. And they went through this same exact process here that we're going to go through today. And so Father McGivney, after he passed away, I'm going to try to get a Google slide up here. Just give me one second here. All right. While we're letting this load, the, of course, what likes to happen is when you actually need technology, things are going to take a little bit longer than normal. But as we're preparing for that to pop up, uh, the first thing is this, is after someone passes away, and here I go, I got it right here. So let's share the screen and uh, we'll get started with this. All right. Here we go. The process of canonization, by the way, that phrase or that Bible verse is taken from the book of Revelation, chapter 8, verse 4, wherein we see what's referred to by, the, uh, by John, the visionary. He sees incense being raised to the throne of God, and he refers to it as the prayers of the saints. Um, since we know those who are in hell cannot or do not want prayers and cannot pray for themselves, and we know those who are in heaven do not need their own prayers because already, they already made it, who are they praying for? The saints are praying for us right? And that is straight out of the Bible that they're praying for us. So a couple of phrases or a couple of terms that we have to get out of the way before we get into the actual process. First is the phrase or the word canonization. And canonization is the formal process by which the church declares a person to be a saint and worthy of universal veneration. That word universal is very important because we're going to see the word, uh, with a beatification, we're going to see another word coming up here soon. Um, but canonization is done by the church. The word canonization comes from the word canon, which means list. So it's just a list. And in the, in the context of our Catholic faith, canonization means to add them to the list of saints, to add them to our Roman martyrology, to declare that they are part of the book of life. That's why we say canonization. And uh, that's where it comes from, that word list. So there is a list of saints. And uh, we're praying that after beatification, uh, Father McGivney reaches this level of canonization. Next is um, an organization in our church that's very important. And in fact, it is a, it is a dicastery, um, um, a curial office that is set up specifically for issues such as beatification and canonization, and that is the Congregation for the Causes of the Saints. So it's a dicastery in Rome that was established in 1558 that makes recommendations to the Pope on beatifications and canonizations. Now, it's important to know that ultimately it is the Pope who makes the declaration. It isn't uh, this organization or this group, this office that says, here, go do it. No, the Pope has to make that declaration, as Pope Francis did in approving the miracle and the approval of the beatification of Father McGivney. So thank you, Holy Father, for doing that for us. Um, but this is the congregation or the office that deals with that. They are also um, in many ways responsible for the authentication and preservation of sacred relics, which reminds me, we need to talk to Supreme eventually about maybe getting a relic of Father McGivney um, uh, for our parishes perhaps or at least have one somewhere in the state, a first class relic. Maybe we'll do a class on relics. I'm just thinking of all these ideas now, all right? But um, relics is what they are also in charge of, the authentication of. There's another phrase, and this is the phrase that is most often the first phrase used for those who are going to be on the pro or in the process of uh, reaching sainthood, and that is servant of God. This one's not often used, or sometimes it's used and people don't know why it's used, Servant of God is an official term used by that dicastery, the Congregation of the Doctrine of Faith, of, sorry, of the Cause of Saints, 
and it's a title given to a candidate for sainthood whose cause is still under investigation prior to being declared venerable. We're going to see here in one of the steps that once a bishop says, you know what, this needs to be brought to Rome. This is something that we need to pursue. Once it gets to Rome, and Rome's like, this is good, we're going to start the investigation. At that point, we can refer to that person as servant of God. Okay? And so sometimes this part is skipped because we don't really hear too much, and all of a sudden they're beatified, right? That happens quite frequently. But servant of God is something that is often used, especially when someone is very, very important to a specific group. I know many knights referred to Father McGivney as servant of God the day that his cause was opened up, all right? And so servant of God is the first of the different uh, terms or titles given to someone who's going through the process of canonization. Next is venerable, all right? And the title venerable is given, oh, let's go back. Sorry. The title venerable um, is given to a candidate for sainthood whose cause has not yet reached beatification, but whose heroic virtue has been declared by the Pope. And that actually happened to Father McGivney. That was in 2008. In 2008, uh, Pope Benedict XVI declared um, Father McGivney to, be, to, have hero to have had heroic virtue and to be worthy of respect and of, um, to be recognized for such. At that point, because not everyone goes, goes through that process of being considered a venerable before they were beatified, some people skip this part, but since 2008, we actually have been under the guidelines of the, co uh, the Congregation for the Cause of Saints, as well as our Catholic tradition. Since 2008, it would have been completely appropriate for us to refer to Father McGivney as Venerable Father McGivney. Now, <clears throat> after someone reaches uh, the Venerable Father McGivney, his, his cultus, or the, the, the uh, extent to which we ask for his intercession, can be expanded a little bit. Remember, we all have the right to um, have private devotion to someone who is not canonized. I recommend that if someone dies and you believe they died in the love of God, that we also pray for them. Let's stop eulogizing people. Purgatory is a real thing. They're not eulogizing, but canonizing people. Purgatory is a real thing. And since they cannot earn or merit any grace on their own in purgatory, we need to pray for those who are in purgatory. Don't forget to pray for the poor souls in purgatory. And so if someone passes away, can you ask for their intercession? Yes, you can ask for their intercession in the hope that they have reached the glory of heaven. However, when I do that with people who have died in my life, I always kind of balance it with a two-sided prayer where I'm asking for prayers, but I also pray for them. You see? Because if they're not yet in the glory of heaven, we should pray for their quick glorification, their quick uh, you know, uh, entrance into the beatific vision. And so that's private. Then we extend it a little bit more when someone becomes a servant of God. For example, I ought to have no problem here with a bunch of brothers or in our council um, saying, Saint, or, or saying, Venerable Father McGivney, pray for us. No problem there. It expands a little bit. And then when you get to, the, um, when you get to uh, uh, Venerable, it's something where now we can go nationwide with it, you know, and Supreme can ask for the intercession of Venerable instead of just Servant of God, which is this. So it goes from private to a little bit bigger to Venerable, which is a little bit bigger. And then eventually... Um, the next step is blessed, and blessed is the title bestowed on a person who has been beatified and accorded limited liturgical veneration. Okay, what does limited liturgical veneration mean? Well, limited liturgical veneration refers to the fact that now it's going to be used not only in a wider sense, you know, blessed Father McGivney, pray for us, which we could do in any public setting now. Um, it's also going to be mentioned in uh, some liturgies, as in it might be mentioned at one of the masses that you go to. However, it is still limited. And some of those functions, uh, some of the rites that it's limited to, for example, is you need to have permission from a bishop to have a specially dedicated mass for a beatified, as in this is the mass of Blessed McGivney. We need permission for that, whereas you don't necessarily need that for saints, for most saints. 
all right? Also, schools and churches are not normally named after blessed. They can be, they can be, um, but it's also, that all has to be done with permission, all right? So think about it. There are some, but there aren't many churches you've been to that were blessed so-and-so church, right? Now, it is possible. I've been to a few, but it's something that's done with permission. For example, I went to the, um, the Anglican Ordinariate, which is the Catholic or the Anglican church that converted to the Catholic church. I went to one of their liturgies um, last year, and their church was named Blessed John Henry Newman, right? Well, he's a saint now, so now it's St. John Henry Newman, but because he was so important to that, that conversion, Rome gave them permission, and the bishop in Los Angeles, or in, uh, uh, I think it was in Costa Mesa, gave them permission to use that as part of their church's name. Um, however, normally, uh, blesseds are not used in churches in the name of a church. You wait until they're a saint, and so they're more uh, prolifically used in the naming of churches and the naming of schools. All right, so this is the third level. We had servants of God, we had venerable, and now we have blessed. This happens after beatification, all right? And we're going to go through the whole process so you know what's required for each one once again. But the last term that we have here is the title saint. saint the title saint is given to someone who has been formally canonized by the church as sharing eternal life with God and therefore offered for public veneration and imitation. So at this part, at this point, this is when churches are named after them. This is when feast days are specifically set up for them. This is when they are no longer just the knights know about them and maybe others in the U.S. know uh, uh, Blessed McGivney. Now the world knows Blessed McGivney, Saint McGivney. The whole world will now have devotion or be called to have devotion to um, this great person who has been made a saint. So again, we have servants of God, then we have venerable, then we have blessed, then we have saint. By the way, if anyone has questions, feel free to type those questions in towards the end of our, uh, our session here. I'll do my best to answer all of the questions at the end. All right. Now let's move into the stages. We know the most important things. We know the, the office that deals with all of this, right? The congregation for uh, the causes of saints. We know the different levels that happen. Servant of God, venerable, blessed, and saint. And now we need to go through the, the process, all right? And so once it gets, so the very first process is examining the life of a candidate for sainthood. And there are two phases. Hope this doesn't get confusing because it seems like they should have just made more stages. But stage one has two phases, all right? The very first phase of stage one is the diocesan or uh, eparchal level. An eparchy, by the way, is a diocese. This is a whole nother lesson here. But an eparchy is a diocese in the Eastern Catholic Church, all right? We don't hear often about it because we have in the world, let's say, about one billion Roman Catholics, but we fail to re remember sometimes that even though we are Roman Catholic and there are 1 billion Roman Catholics, there are about 20, 20 million others, not Eastern Orthodox, that's different, 20 million others that are a part of 22 other recognized rites of the Catholic Church. You're talking about the um, Byzantine Catholics and the Coptic Catholics and the uh, 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 Syro Malabar Catholics, right? These are all different Eastern rites. But we don't hear about them too much because they really are a small percentage, like less than a percent of the entirety of the church. But they are no less Catholic and no less important. We just don't often hear about them. However, um, an eparchy is a diocese, but for the Eastern Rite of the church. Okay? So the first stage is there. It's when it hits this stage. Now, these are the rules as of right now. Keep in mind. Oftentimes when I do a presentation like this, someone will be like, well, but it didn't happen for this person. And Pope John Paul II didn't happen that way. And this didn't happen that way. Let's remember the foundation of why this even happens or what gives the church authority to do it. It comes from both Matthew 16, 18 and Matthew 18, 18, wherein 
the church is given the authority to bind and loose. The church has the authority to make decisions, to make rules, to teach. And as such, if a pope, by the way, a pope made these rules over a period of time, back in the 16th century, a pope made some of these rules, and every time they're modified, even if, let's say, Pope Benedict or Pope Francis wants to modify a rule to get someone to be canonized, they have complete authority to do that. If they want to do that, they're the ones that make the rules. And I hope that makes sense, okay? That's how um, the rules are made. Here's the normal way that it works. Five years must pass from the time of a candidate's death before a cause may, be, may begin. This is just a side joke, might be a horrible joke. I always wondered when I saw those five years if that's where the NFL got it when it came to uh, waiting five years until someone was in the Hall of Fame. <laughs> Bad joke, okay, sorry. We'll move on from there. But five years must pass after um, uh, a candidate's death before a cause may begin. This is so that all of their writings can be uh, collected and it, it allows for more objectivity in the investigation process. Okay, and so the first person that needs to be um, on board with this is the bishop. Okay, so the bishop in an area is the first person to begin the investigation, okay? And then that person will, uh, uh, will declare somebody or will assign someone to be what's known as a petitioner. And that petitioner um, will formally ask the bishop to open investigation. So it's kind of worked out. The bishop could bring it up himself, but there's usually a process where even if it was just Bishop Silva, he might be like, hey, uh, Brother Bill Hayes, will you be the petitioner to bring this up to me so we can have a formal document that says it was asked for and I'm approving it. Once that happens and the bishop agrees, okay, then the investigation begins on the local level. The bishop then begins a series of consultations with the Episcopal Conference normally, so he'll go to the rest of the bishops in the U.S. Um, and then also uh, he'll start that communication with the Holy See, uh, and, uh, namely the Congregation for the Causes of Saints. All right. Once the consultations are done and he has received the nihil obstat, which means without error from the Holy See, he forms a tribunal on, in his diocese. All right. At that point, Rome has said, Bishop, you can go ahead with his, this investigation. That makes the person servant of God, okay? Once Rome approves the bishop's investigation and they can move forward, that would make them servant of God, okay? So the tribunal will investigate, the diocesan tribunal will investigate the martyrdom if they were martyred or the heroic quality of the person's life. They search for heroic virtues in that life. So what virtues would that be? That would be the theological virtues of faith, hope, and charity, and then also the cardinal virtues, which are prudence, justice, temperance, and fortitude. Um, and then also other virtues that might be important in their state of life. So if he was a virtuous person, but was not living as a priest, that would be a bad thing. Was, was he saying his mass? Was he hearing? Was he a good priest? If one of us brothers were ever put up for um, canonization, those who are not priests, we wouldn't have to be judged in that way. Were you a good husband? Were you a good father? So there, you see how there's different virtues depending on the person's state in life. Okay, witnesses might be called because if it's only been five years, there's a reasonable chance that there are people who are alive who knew the person, okay? And so, uh, and, and in fact, um, you know, uh, people know uh, Father, uh, we have priests alive in our diocese who worked with St. Teresa, Mother Teresa, right? And we also uh, have people who were personal friends with St. John Paul II. And so it's, it's possible to um, have people who are alive who knew the saint. So witnesses are called, uh, uh, interviews are done. And then also any documents that the person may have written are kind of, you know, almost ad nauseum looked at and researched. Okay, they're not looking for humanness, right? I mean, there's sometimes where the, the person was having a bad day. I mean, think about St. Damien. His first journal entry said that he was scared of being in Molokai and he was scared of being near the natives, right? That were suffering, but you see this transformation over time to him being in solidarity with them. And what is true solidarity? True solidarity, true solidarity 
is becoming indistinguishable from the people you're serving. And that's what uh, St. Damien did. And so they have to read all his writings. They have to do interviews of the different witnesses that may have known him. And then after that's done, all of that information is gathered and then it is presented. By the way, I skipped the second phase. After, oh, yep, after it is uh, all gathered, it is, it is given to Rome, okay? So it's handed over from Rome. There isn't gonna be any further declaration from our bishop. It would at that point all be handed over to Rome. Now, what I will say is that there are some times where a bishop will find something in the interviews that kind of halts the whole thing, right? It kind of halts the whole thing and kind of puts an end to it. There are um, different reasons that that happens. Uh, you know, maybe something's revealed in that person's life. Imagine if the, uh, who to all, you know, senses seem to be a holy person. Imagine if the founder of the Legionnaires were put up for uh, canonization too quickly, right? Right, these people who have found to be not who they said they were later on, right? We need to uh, make sure that we uh, have some time and take this serious, this investigation. After it passes the investigation and the bishops is satisfied with what he has collected, he calls it, he uh, brings it forward to the congregation of the doctrine of faith. All right. Once the diocesan or uh, eparchy has finished their investigation, it's sent to the Congregation for the Causes of Saints. At this point, it goes through further investigation. There are nine theologians that are uh, assigned to studying the life of the person that's been brought to their attention. They read all the writings that are there. Um, they, uh, they, they ask the bishop and any other uh, priest. They, they might do special investigations of their own witnesses and whatnot. And then after that is done and they find no fault and they find heroic virtue and Rome agrees at that point, I'm sorry, you hear my child screaming in the back there. <laughs> I have six of them. You're going to hear some screaming. Um, after Rome says, you're right, this person did live heroic virtue. This person is worthy of this process of canonization. At that point in this phase two, after Rome agrees that this is all true, you've done your job, they might send it back to the diocese, be like, you haven't done enough yet. But once they know that they've done enough and these theologians and this office says they've done enough, at that point is normally when the Pope will make some sort of declaration of heroic virtue. They'll basically make a declaration that this person lived a life demonstrative of heroic virtue. We already had servants of God when this whole thing started. So just a quick quiz, after heroic virtue is declared in this phase two, what do we call them at that point? It's venerable, okay? So once it gets to phase two and Rome says, this is good to go, this person did lead, lead a life of heroic virtue, this person is worthy of moving on to the process of beatification, though that takes some time. And so the Pope will come out and say, this person is worthy of uh, veneration. This person is venerable. This person le led a life of heroic virtue. All right. And so since 2008, Father McGivney could have been referred to, and I tried to, as, as long as I remembered, refer to him as venerable Father Michael J. McGivney. All right. So that's been that way. And technically, that's what we should refer to him today because he has not yet been beatified. So Venerable Father McGivney is his title as of right now because he passed this stage, stage two. Stage three is a beatification. And a beatification is uh, all of the major work has been done already about the heroic virtue, studying their teachings, studying the witnesses, and all of that. They're not going to go back on any of that. It's already done. This next phase is where we wait for a miracle. We wait for a confirmed miracle. And let me tell you, it's not just a bunch of people who email and say, this was cured, that was cured, this was cured. No, it is a long, arduous process that sometimes takes decades to finally find a miracle that is approved by the Congregation for the Causes of Saints. Many, many doctors are involved. Many, many doctors are involved. And if there's any 
absolutely any reasonable scientific explanation that is easily attributed to why someone was healed or why something happened, it is not going to be accepted as a miracle, okay? That's very important to know. This has to be truly an example of something that all the doctors look at and they're just like, I have, I have no clue. That, at that point, that would be brought through more scrutiny and then eventually once the doctors all agree that this has no reasonable explanation besides the intervention of something beyond science, then it's brought to the table of our Roman pontiff, who right now is uh, our Holy Father, Pope Francis, and then it is brought to his uh, desk for approval, okay? Now, one side note, beatification does not need a miracle when the person is declared to have been a martyr. I don't know if you knew that, okay? They don't need a declared miracle if the person had, can be shown to have been a martyr. That's why back in 2008, when Benedict XVI beatified a bunch of the Japanese martyrs, if you remember that, there was no miracle attributed to them because it was proven that they all died for the faith, you see? And so there wasn't a need to go through that initial process of finding a single miracle, all right? Now, uh, what we'll do is, after I wrap things up, we'll end, I'm almost done here, we're gonna uh, end with the video of the miracle that has been, has been attributed to and approved um, by uh, Rome as being attributable to Father McGivney. So once it is approved, there is a ceremony celebrated in Rome by the Holy Roman Pontiff, and then that person will be considered beatified, will be considered a blessed. And at that point, so on October 31st, instead of saying, Venerable Father McGivney, pray for us, we'll say, Blessed Father McGivney, or just Blessed McGivney, pray for us. I'm excited. I got goosebumps when I said that. We're only two months away, not even two months away, a month and a half and away from us, to, uh, from us being able to say that openly and it be true, not just in the context of a class where we're studying it. The last phase is, oh, I think I skipped, uh, yeah, so back in stage two, sorry, back in stage two was the beatification. Now in stage three, we are at canonization. And canonization is all that's necessary from someone to be lifted from a beatification to canonization is the declaration and approval of one more miracle, okay? So folks, brothers, and families, we need to pray for one more miracle that's attributable to uh, Father McGivney. After he's beatified, it might take a year, it might take a month, it might take 10 years, right? Because Rome doesn't fool around when it comes to approving miracles. Um, that's why there are so many great people who took for it. John Henry Newman, one of the greatest theologians of all time, it took hundreds of years for them to find one single miracle, right? And so uh, we have to pray for a quick uh, miracle that can be attributed to Father McGivney um, after he's beatified on his way to canonization. Um, as a side, since I had mentioned that martyrs do not need that initial miracle, for a martyr who is considered a blessed uh, to become a saint, they would need one miracle, all right? So they still need that miracle. Everyone who makes it to sainthood has to have that one miracle attributed to them. And so that is the final stage. What I will say, is that there, there were many, um, I do have some of the notes here. Uh, his cause for sainthood was opened in 1997 in the Diocese of Hartford, Connecticut. You probably know that's where he was from. That was his diocese. So in 1997 is when uh, the title Servant of God could have been openly used by Brother Knights or by others to refer to Father McGivney. It was in 2008 that Pope Benedict declared uh, Father McGivney a venerable in recognition of his heroic virtue, 2008. So 1997 and then 2008. And then this year in May, in May even though um, there is a list of miracles that ask for the intercession or healings that happened after the intercession of Father McGivney that were brought to Rome, they went through many that they, they said, I, we can't say this is a miracle because it probably happened because of this, etc. Well, in May, um, the Holy Father recognized a miracle um, that is attributable to Father McGivney 
uh, for a child who was diagnosed with a terminal illness in the womb. I, how amazing that this is the miracle that happened because Father McGivney and the Knights and their, their staunch, never-ending commitment to the sanctity of human life for this miracle to be attributed to him is amazing. So there was a child who was diagnosed in the womb to have a terminal illness and um, they were healed after interceding, um, asking for the intercession of Father McGivney. And because of that, he will be beatified on October 31st of this year. So what I want to do now is we're going to very briefly stop this share so I can start it again. We're going to watch a video uh, of the miracle that has been attributed to Father McGivney. And this one was actually produced by Supreme. Michael, will you sing us a song? Sing Hail Mary. Hail Mary. Hail Mary. Hail Mary. God writes the, the best stories. And we didn't realize what he was doing in our lives or what he was doing in the world when all this was going on. Only looking back on it did we see all of those things that lined up to bring us to this day. And we sit there with our mouth hanging open. Michael, he's always been a miracle to us. You know, we've always called him a miracle. But then there's a part of you that doesn't realize the gravity of the miracle. You can tell that God is, is a real player in their family. He's not a, a hobby. He's actually a person who lives in their house with them. I started with the Knights in 2005, and I decided I would look into being a Knights of Columbus insurance agent after reading Parish Priest, because I really felt like coming into this business, I have to be an apostle of Father McGivney. Latching on to his mission and seeing how important it was that we take care of Catholic families. And that's when our family kind of started developing a devotion to Father McGivney. It was December 31st that we had the ultrasound that revealed the Down syndrome. We didn't have a problem with the Down syndrome at all. In fact, I told Michelle, I said, what a blessing for our children to be able to grow up around someone like that. But we were advised that we probably needed to get some additional testing done. They shuffled us into a small room, pulled the ultrasound up on the screen, showing us how his body looked like it was completely full of fluid, like a little balloon. He said, well, this is going to be terminal. He has fetal high drops diagnosis. You have basically two options. One would be to go ahead and terminate the pregnancy now, or you can wait for him to die on his own, and then we'll just induce a stillbirth labor. The day that I was given 0% chance of the baby surviving, I kneeled down and I told God, if you let him die, I will still love you, Lord. But it'll take me a while to forgive you. But I promise to still love you. I kind of just had an agony in the garden moment. I said, Father McGivney, if you will pray for him, then we will change his name and I, I will name him after you. Every year, the Knights of Columbus puts on an incentive trip for their agents. So in January of 2014, it was announced that we were going with a pilgrimage to Fatima. So they had told me that they were there praying for the health of their baby and that would probably require a miracle. So praying especially to Father Michael J. McGivney for that made perfect sense to me. Daniel and I asked all of our friends that were close to please pray through the intercession of Father McGivney on the day that we were in Fatima. I just kept thinking, Lord, let this baby be the miracle. If he's Father McGivney's miracle, then he will live. The reading of the day, it just hit us both pretty hard. But Jesus says to the man that comes and asks him to, to heal his son, go forth, your son will live. I just, I remember looking at Michelle with my mouth hanging open, you know, thinking, wow, how powerful is that? Physically, I felt like a veil was lifted. 
The brokenness in my heart was softened, probably from the words, you may go in peace, your son will live. And then we came home, and I went to the appointment for the ultrasound to see where the baby was. She came in and read the ultrasound, and everything looked like a normal Down syndrome baby. And that's when the doctor realized and had to flip through the charts and say, oh, I know who you are now. <laughs> she didn't realize from looking at the ultrasound that we were the family with high drops. That is the moment where you have to acknowledge that something has happened here that was miraculous. The doctor printed off one of the little sheets on ultrasound. She said, look at this picture of this baby. This is the prettiest baby I have ever seen in my life. He was born on May 15th. And that is actually the day that Council One of the Knights of Columbus was founded. And then the first doctor told me that Michael wouldn't live came in. And I never will forget, as long as I live, she said, Michelle, I never thought we would be here. It has been the honor of my life to deliver your little precious baby. I think there are times in your life you think you've seen a miracle. But when somebody tells you that you have, it's even more special. And he is a miracle in a lot of ways, but he came to the right family. I think Michael definitely has changed our family for the better. He's taught us how to love someone who doesn't have to earn your love. I think he's taught us how to help people who are helpless, and he's just brought so much joy to our family and everything that he does. I just walked downstairs one day and everyone was all screaming like, oh, it's approved. It's still mind blowing to me that the Pope approved it, that our God used our family in this way. Like I, I can't even comprehend all of the people that this could touch and help out, you know, and it's just really amazing. If there's a child that Father McGivney would want to help, this is the one. You know, he's the youngest of 13. Father McGivney was the oldest of 13. The Knights of Columbus is very deep into the movement of those with special needs. He's one of the most loving children I've ever seen. And he has true joy. He makes everyone feel loved. God wrote this story. God chooses the miracles. God chooses who is beatified. He chooses who is canonized. He wants Father McGivney to be honored, and so he shall be. I don't know how anyone can watch that and just know that God is real, that God loves us, and he has a plan for every baby that is conceived of in a mother's womb. What an amazing miracle to be able to attribute to uh, Father McGivney, and uh, what an amazing thing for us to be a part of. Um, uh, how, many, how many brothers have gone before us maybe even hoping for this day. And um, God willing, we all make it to next month when uh, you know, we can be a, a part of history for um, uh, our, our, our fraternal order here. Um, one little side note just to end. I do see a few questions I'll answer. But one little side note, I think you already know this, but uh, Father McGivney will not be the first one who, is, uh, who was canonized. Eventually, when he becomes canonized, we actually already have six uh, brother knights who have been canonized. I'm not sure if you're aware of that, but there are six brother knights that were canonized. They were uh, in Mexico. They were all part of the Cristeros War. They were all Cristeros. And it was, I have it written here, St. Uh, Louis Batiste, St. Rodrigo Aguilar, St. Miguel de la Mora, St. Pedro de Jesus Maldonado, St. Jose Maria Robles, and St. Mateo Correa. And they are all saints from the Cristeros War. If you're interested, a very good movie to watch for that 
is their movie called For Greater Glory, all right? And it's uh, very well made. It actually has some, it has Eva Longoria and Daniel Garcia. So it's, you know, it's, it's not secondary level. I mean, you got some big name actors, you got A-list actors in that one. And it's about the persecution of the Catholics during communist Mexico. Um, and so even though you, I don't think these saints are mentioned in the movie directly, um, the, saint, the, the, the priests that you see who are martyred in the movie and whatnot, they, might, they could have been right, a representative of our brother uh, knights who were um, martyred um, in the Castellos War. Um, so that, that's it. That's the presentation. Um, I will uh, remind you that, of course, um, the process of canonization by the authority of the Pope can be changed. So even with that said, I didn't find the timeline from the Congregation of the Cause of Saints. I don't have their meeting minutes. So is the process I mentioned exactly the way that it happened with Father McGivney? It's possible that it didn't. And in fact, um, it, would, it would take them to tell us the exact things that happened. What I gave you tonight was a general outlook on how canonizations normally happen in our modern time. Um, there have been uh, saints in recent times that have been what we would call fast tracked, as in, you know, kind of jumped the, the, the line of some of the um, normal protocol. For example, uh, St. John Paul II. Um, however, I will say that the Pope made that declar the Pope made the exception. And again, the Pope has the authority to do that. All right. So he did it and it counts. And um, also because a Pope does it and the formulation that he uses, it is infallible. Uh, when it's done by the Pope in that way, all right? So when someone's declared a Pope, the part that's infallible, this is a whole nother lesson, but the part that's infallible is the declaration that that person is in heaven, okay? That is the part that's infallible. You know, if, if someone wants to disagree later on, well, we found that this person probably wasn't the most prudent person, you know, we shouldn't, follow that part of, you know, so, okay, can you disagree with things that the person did or say they weren't the best example of this? Yes. The canonization doesn't infallibly declare that part, all right? The part that's infallible is that they are in heaven. And so all of the, uh, uh, the, the divisive talk about saints who are fast-tracked and whatnot, I get it. I understand some people's issues with it. Um, the reality is, is they are in heaven. And if they are in heaven, they, even though I love Brother Chuck, they're slightly above Brother Chuck in the power of intercession, okay? So we should ask for their prayers, all right? Um, can a status ever be pulled from a canonized person? No, they cannot ever be pulled. What can happen, though, is in the case of the historicity of a person, um, it can be pulled from the calendar, as in they're not going to ever stop calling him a saint, but because there's an issue with historicity, as in the really, really early, like St. Let's say, for example, St. Christopher, right? Or uh, maybe even St. George, some question the historicity of these people, they will always be known as saints. However, it's possible that uh, whatever day they had a memorial on in the calendar, that part can be removed, okay? So that has happened in the past. Um, my response to that is simply that just like how I knew stories um, from, you know, old Hawaiian myths and legends, and they made up a name of somebody, some character in our history. And was it, that re was it really that person's name? No, we're not sure, but we know that somebody who we call, whatever name we call them, did this thing. In the early church, that happened sometimes too. What I'm saying is that was there someone that did the things and represented the things that St. Christopher did? Absolutely. Right? The historicity question is whether or not that person was named St. Christopher. You see? And so when you pray to St. Christopher, there is somebody up there who hears your prayer. I guarantee it. And by the way, even if there wasn't, if we throw up a prayer, it's not God's, God's not like, well, dodging that prayer. Right? No. God hears all the prayers that we uh, send up. All right? And so um, St. George was a virtuous man. Did he literally fight a a fire breathing dragon? I don't know, probably not. <laughs> but does it mean that St. George and what he did isn't representative of an actual person who is now in heaven? Of course it is, right? 
And so we can defend and stand by even those who are eventually maybe perhaps because of historicity removed from the calendar, they're still part of our community. We're still brothers with them. And of course, we can ask for their intercession.